So the title of today's message is You're Not Him. You're Not Him. Let it, leave it to the youth pastor to bring a pop culture phrase and make it a sermon title. So that's exactly what I'm doing today. It could, it could be You're Not Him or the opposite, the positive part of that is semi-positive part of that is I'm Him. So we're, we're going to see what that really means is somebody is claiming that they're successful, that they, were, they reached the mark, they reached the goal, they triumphed over something or somebody else. If you go on YouTube and you look up athletes using this phrase, which I see a lot because I'm in the world of sports and I watch a lot of sports, you'll see, you'll see when athletes get mic'd up for their games and they throw a touchdown pass and they celebrate saying, I'm him, or a basketball player shooting a game-winning shot and he misses it and the other team mocks, you're not him. And today's message is a humble piece of humble pie for us, a humble perspective that we are not him. So for us to remember Christ is him, and we, but we st- should still strive for success. I wanna make sure we understand that I'm not against competitive drive and passion and doing things to the best that we should because it's actually biblical that we should do that. But what's important is the way that we win and the way that we succeed matters just as much as obtaining the success itself. It's not just about did you win, did you succeed, how you do so matters just as much, if not more. All of our success should glorify the Lord in any, in any factor, any aspect of life, life, whether you are doing athletics, whether you are at work, at school, doing a hobby, whatever you're doing, you should glorify the Lord through it. Romans 12 verses one and two says this, therefore I urge you brothers and sisters in view of God's mercy, you know those, that uh, phrase Pastor Jody always says, when you put on your, your scripture glasses, you view life through the frames of God's worldview, God's word, word. that's what, exactly what scripture 12, 1, Romans 12.1 is saying. In view of God's mercy, let God's mercy be the frames we see things through. Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. There's gonna be a theme throughout this teaching of are the things we do in life about self-promotion or is it about glorifying the Lord? Because the world says to get as much, you, as, much as you can, to lift yourself up, to seek gathering the things of the world, the newest things, the most valuable things. But scripture says in Matthew 6, 33, but seek first the kingdom, his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added onto you. We should be seeking the things of God's kingdom, our eyes on the kingdom of heaven and he will take care of what the earthly things that we need to have in our lives according to his will. We need to not conform to the pattern of the world, which is to obtain, obtain things, things that you can pass down. It's all about gathering. When scripture says that it's all, everything will go strangely dim at the end. Why obtain more things when we should be focused on eternal things? We need to renew our minds on what it actually means to sacrifice. To sacrifice means to give something up ourselves for the pleasing or benefit of somebody else. And that's often looked at in a negative way. Yes, we're gonna, we're choosing obedience and to not do things of the world because we don't wanna conform to the pattern of the world, but sacrifice is not just what we give up. The negative things that we think we want to pursue, but it's fleshly desires. It's not just sacrificing those things. It's also the good things in your life is a sacrifice to the Lord. The blessings, the things that the Lord does give you, 
the positive things, the blessings in life, those are also meant to be a sacrifice to the Lord. Let's look at Colossians 3, verses 3 and 4. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Our success should glorify him. It says here, he glorifies us in the end. We don't need to pursue glorifying ourselves, lifting ourselves up, making sure people know our name. We should be doing everything we can in our lives to make sure everybody knows Christ's name. He glorifies us in the end. So we should glorify him now with our lives. Let's look down to verse 17. Amen. Let's look down to verse 17 in Colossians 3. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So I remember the first time I was taught this and rebuked this verse in my life. I was running sprints at basketball practice in high school. Well, I really wasn't running sprints. I was supposed to be. And I was kind of giving a half effort. I just wasn't feeling it that day. And so my coach, my coach Randy Chambers pulled me aside and he said, your actions right now, I know you're not trying, they're not biblical. And I was like, what are you talking about? I know the 10 commandments and do not be lazy. It's not one of the 10 commandments. He said, open up, open up to Colossians 3.17 and everything you do, whether word or deed, do so in the name of the Lord. You're not doing these sprints in the name of the Lord. He said, what's the name on the front of your jersey right now? I was like, I said, Calvary. He said, what is Calvary? I knew. I said, this is where, that's where Christ died and was crucified. And he said, did Christ give a half effort on the cross? That's the one that hits you. I said, no, he gave everything for us. He said, so give everything. And everything that you do, if Christ was here telling you to run these suicides, run these sprints to get in shape, you'd be sprinting. I was like, you're correct, I would be. So go do it. And whatever arena you find yourself in life, in work, in school, do so, do everything you can to your best ability to succeed. Striving for success is not wrong. We should be trying to succeed in all we do. But like I was saying, our motivation for it, our motivation for it, that's what matters. That's the first point of tonight, or this morning, sorry. I'm used to preaching in the evening. What motivates you to succeed? We see an example of why motivation is so important in Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20, James and John seek to be seated at the left and the right of Jesus. A good place to be. They desire to be near Jesus, as we all should. But does Jesus praise them for, for that? No. He rebukes them, saying, you were not sharing my suffering. You're not willing to drink my cup. See, they desired to be in the right spot, but their motivation for it was wrong. They were, they were motivated because they want to be uplifted with Christ because they still thought he was going to be conquering the Romans, dethroning Caesar, and setting up a new kingdom for Israel. And in this new kingdom, they wanted to sit at the left and right of Jesus on the throne. But Jesus did not say to pick up your thrones and follow me. He told them to pick up their crosses and follow him. But he knows they're not willing to do so. They're going to scatter when he's crucified anyway. They were not willing to be hung on his left and his right, but they were willing to sit at his left and right. They were seeking the presence of Jesus, but f fully for their own motivation to be lifted high for people to see them and who they are. Their motivation was not, they were not motivated by Christ. They're motivated to be near him for their own self-pleasure and glorification. 
We need to make sure that Christ is our motivation, that God motivates us to succeed. We're gonna look at how David was motivated by the name of the Lord and not his own success. First Samuel chapter 17, verse, we're gonna start in verse 45, but verse 26 is the backstory. When David shows up to the battlefield and he sees Goliath and the Philistines defying the name of the Lord, he sees them blaspheming God's name. And he says, who is this Philistine that's defying God and his army? In verse 45, David says to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the army of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day, I'll give the carcass of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals. And the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword and spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's and he will give all of you into my hands. So we see David's holy, righteous confidence here, knowing he's taking down Goliath. Now the battle's already won. He's taken down Goliath in the name of the Lord. He said, the Lord will deliver you into my hands. Everyone will know the battle is the Lord's. This was his first real public appearance, David. He was already anointed to be the future king of Israel. And now all of Israel is looking at him on the battlefield. Oh, he could have pointed at himself. He could have told them who he really was, who he was destined to be that he was destined to be king, but he did none of that. His motivation was not about self. It was purely about defending the name of the Lord. The Lord will deliver you into my hands, says David. Let's continue verse 48. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly towards the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it, struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone the stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone without a sword in his hand and he struck down the Philistine and killed him. David ran and stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine's sword and drew it from its sheath. After killing him, he cut off his head with the sword. When the Philistine saw their hero was dead, they turned and ran. Then the men of Israel and Judah surged forward with a shout and pursued the Philistines to the entrance of Gath and to the gates of Ekron. Their dead were strewn along the Sharim road to Gath and Ekron. When the Israelites returned from chasing the Philistines, they plundered their camp. Why did the Philistines run? Why didn't they run into battle to try and defeat? Because in verse six, it says, that this battle was a one versus one for the entire nation, for both nations to be represented. Whoever's champion lost, the losing nation would become the other's servants and slaves. And so when David took down Goliath, the Philistines ran because the victory had already been won by David and the Israelites. There's things that we can take away from David's story like I've already said, our motivation for why we do what we do. What did David do? That we should try and reflect that in our own lives. But when we read this story, it's important to know that we are not David. We are the Israelites. It's important to know that David represents Jesus coming in the future. David conquered over Goliath and the Philistines and saved all of Israel from slavery. Jesus conquered over sin and death and saved all of us from the slavery of sin, amen? We are the Israelites that were saved by David. We are the Israelites. We are God's people saved by Jesus. He conquered over sin and death. He already won the victory. He, he is alive. He rose from the grave. He's seated in heaven. So we are meant to go. Just like when David conquered Goliath, 
What did the Israelites do? They ran and stormed the battlefield. They chased the, the, the Philistines back to their cities and they took ground for the kingdom of Israel. Jesus already conquered. We're now meant to do what Jesus said. He told us to go. He told us to go and make disciples, go into all the world. He's already won. His victory is won. We're meant to go and take ground for the kingdom of heaven, pushing back darkness, making disciples. Amen. Amen. Second, second point is how do you respond to the success that you have? First was what motivates you. This is how do you respond once success is obtained? When you have the position, when you get the audience, the platform, when you get the promotion, when you get the, the money, when you get whatever you are obtaining, when you triumph over something or somebody else, how do you respond? Is it self-promotion? I'm him. Or is, do we glorify the Lord? Another sports illustration, because that's who I am. When you see somebody run into the end zone, you often see a lot of athletes go like this, pointing to the name on the back of their jersey. Remember who I am. Look what I did. And we're not meant to do that. People are not meant to know who we are. When you succeed, you should not care if people know your name or not. We're not meant to go like this. Look what we did. Look what I did. We're meant to go like this. Look at who Christ is. Look at what Christ has done through you. The truth is success in life, when we, when we live out Colossians 3.17 and, and we live to succeed in life, when, when we are motivated by Christ and we do, we have triumphs, we have success. You have, you have promotions, you are built up in the status of the world. The opportunities will come, the eyeballs will look your way. The chances for you to glorify the Lord in front of others will happen. They'll happen naturally because the world cares about those things we don't, we care to glorify the Lord. So when the opportunity comes and you've had your success, how do you respond? Do you glorify the Lord? Do you take that chance of, oh, people are looking. I'm gonna make sure they know and they remember who I am. Will they remember my name? Or when people see you, will they remember Christ through you? How do you lead when you have that position? How do you lead biblically? When you've retained the position of the power, if, when you have, if you have subordinates that work under you in your workplace, do you encourage and uplift them and train them? Or do you think they're there to serve you and to lift you up? Jesus said that in his kingdom, the first shall be last. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And yet he came down from heaven and washed his disciples' feet. When we obtain success, it's an opportunity for us to serve others and glorify the name of the Lord and not try and soak up the spotlight for ourselves. This also goes with the things that we obtain. The money or the, the objects, the items, whatever we obtain in life, that should not be our motivation. But when we have them, how do we glorify the Lord with it? Proverbs 3, 9 says, honor the Lord with your wealth and from the first of all your produce? Do we honor the Lord with what he's given us or do we just store it, just save it or just spend it on ourselves? 2 Corinthians 9, 6, 16 through 17, sorry, 6 and 7 says, the point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly and whoever sows bountiful will reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart not reluctantly or under compulsion for God loves a cheerful giver. We are meant to give to the Lord, to his work and his kingdom. Yes, this includes tithing, but this also is with whatever God has given you. A few months ago in this terrible time in my life called winter, I was driving home. <laughs> Anybody agree with that, right? I was driving home and there was this man on the corner holding a sign saying he was cold and hungry. So I went home and I packed a bag and I, I put a coat in it, hats, some gloves, those shakeable hand warmers and some granola bars. And I took it back to him and I said, God bless you. And I prayed with him, told him God loves him. And it was a brief encounter. And then I left. 
that was, I didn't give him any money. It, I didn't honor God with my money in that sense. But when I give to the Lord, that does. But I honor God with my wealth at that moment. We're, we're meant to honor God with anything we have. Your wealth is the things that you have. So how can you honor God, give to God what he has given to you? Like I said, it is the money, but it's beyond that. How can you honor God with anything and everything that he's given you? We're going to close by looking at three ways that we can implement these, this teaching of being motivated by Christ and succeeding Christ-like. We're going to look at three quick ways that we can do that in our lives this week. The first is let others praise you and you boast in the Lord only. Proverbs 27.2 says this, let someone else praise you, not your own mouth. An outsider, not your own lips. Don't be the person that's always bringing attention back to yourself. I had to struggle with this a lot when I was a teenager. I wanted people to know if I was good or successful at something. Don't be the person that's always sharing just about yourself. Ask the questions about others. Boast in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 1.31 says, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Don't try and one-up people all the time. Boast in what the Lord does. We're meant to point at Christ, not at the name of ourselves. The second is have a thankful heart. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ. Make it a habit this week to track the blessings that God has given you and have a thankful heart for it. Give thanks to God for it. Say little prayers, thanking God for all the things he's doing in your life. From the little things of waking up, opening your eyes in the morning to the bigger things of when the paycheck hits your bank account. Give thanks to the Lord in all things. When you do so, you'll actually notice a change in your heart and a change in your mindset of how you, how you view the world. Because this is part of crucifying our flesh and not conforming to the world but renewing our minds to do these things because it's not natural for the flesh to focus on the positive. We know humanity looks at the negative, just turn on the news, it's all over it. So we gotta crucify our flesh and actually renew our minds and focus on the blessings and the positive things in life. And you'll notice your mood and your attitude towards things and people and life change because you will then be living in God's will. What does it say? Give thanks in all circumstances. This is God's will for you. So when you're living in God's will, you're gonna be more joyful. You're gonna be more happy. Things, you're gonna view things as God wants you to view them. Your eyes will be on eternal things. Seek first his kingdom. Here's one way we seek his kingdom first by being thankful for the things he's given us and you're walking and living and remembering and speaking in God's will for your life. It completely changes the way you live and your outlook on life. And the third is to humble yourself, to remember where you are and who you are without Christ. No matter how successful or influential, or talented or rich you become in life, all those things mean nothing eternally. We can't take them with us to heaven. This life is short, eternity is forever and we can't take that stuff with us. Who are we, are, who are we are without Christ? We're dead in our sins and dead in our transgressions. Here's the, here's the amazing part about those things that God gives us, those blessings that we get. We can attach eternal value to those things that have no intrinsic eternal value. When we, glory, when we get money or get things or obtain things or have success and we give them back to the Lord or we reflect our glory and give it to God and people say, good job for this and you give thanks to the Lord, now you're giving things that have no real eternal value actual eternal value because you're putting Jesus' name on it. Romans teaches us for the wages of sin or death, which is where we are without Christ. But the gift of God is eternal life. All those things, those, in, those things in your life, they're not bad. Those things are gifts from God. The blessings of life are gifts from God, but the gift of God is Christ Jesus through which we have eternal life.
Our last scripture for the day, today is John 8, verse 58. Very truly I tell you, Jesus said, before Abraham was, before Abraham was born, I am. Jesus says, I am. When Moses was speaking to God in the burning bush, God said, go tell the people that I am sent you. I am translating to, and in Hebrew that it means Yahweh. Tell them Yahweh sent you. We need to remember today, we are not I am. You are not him. We are not him. Christ is him. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, help us live humbly to give thanks to remember who we are in you, who we are without you. I pray that we would strive for success as you teach us in Colossians 3 and that we would give all things, all praise and glory belongs to you and that we would point back to Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.